Now here's one with uh, bells on. It was hailed as a revolutionary work when it came out 20 years ago, in the days when music came on vinyl discs called LPs. Remember them? It seems Mike Oldfield's tubular bells found its way into everyone's record collection. Two decades on, and Mike F Oldfield has done it again. Tubular Bells 2 has been out just over a week since it was premiered at the uh, Edinburgh Castle, and it shot straight to the top of the album chart. For a sequel to an epic work 20 years ago, it's perhaps not surprising that many of the images are the same, if updated, in Tubular Bells 2. The familiar album cover has been brought into the 90s with the latest photographic techniques, and Mike Oldfield now makes full use of computers to enhance the sound of the work. Nevertheless, echoes of 1972 remain. It you know, came many, many times, and I drew out in diagrams all the ingredients of it and I realized that I have to have elements of those ingredients to make it to be a, a good part too and as I was writing it I found that if if I went too far away from Tubular Bells 1 then it wasn't right this time round, the man many view as the ultimate musician came together with the producer they called the ultimate technician Trevor Horn the thing about a record like this is that the instruments don't stay the same from the start through to the finish, they're changing all the time the instrumentation, and that's you know, technically that was qu quite difficult to cope with at times because you have something an hour long, spread across 48 tracks that changes constantly throughout the hour. I'm sure you, you, it, it's quite difficult to deal with it. <laughs> He's the first to admit that Tubular Bells was written at a time when his life was in turmoil. Some people turned to drugs or vandalism, he says. He turned to music. And though the problems haven't gone away completely, 20 years on, he finds it easier to cope. Ironing out those problems, or some of them, or, or, or yeah, ironing them a bit, so that you uh, at least understand them and they're not, they're not like great big pigs that you have to climb and troughs that you have to fall into. He says he's surprised that the original didn't spawn a series of copies. But in a music industry where the emphasis is on short, catchy chart records, he hopes Tubular Bells 2 will encourage a new type of fan, where listeners can become involved in the music. dramatic wasn't it joining us now from our central london studio is rock critic matt snow to give us his thoughts about the success <coughs> excuse me of tubular bells too matt a very good afternoon to you good afternoon to you is there room in the 90s music scene for tubular bells too is it not a bit outdated well tubular bells one was certainly a record of its time tubular bells two in an era of acid house music or rave music um why not? Uh, the music scene at the moment is so fragmented and it's music, pop music sells to so many different people now. Back in 1972, perhaps pop music was sold to people aged between about 15 and 25. Now it's between about 10 and 55 um, and blurring at the edges either side. So I don't think that um, pop music follows fashions. Um, or indeed sets fashions in quite the same rigid ways it did in the 60s and in the early 70s. So yes, there's plenty of room. It's gone to the top of the charts, and uh, I think that proves that there is room enough for that, certainly. So who's buying it? It'll be bought by a lot of the people who bought the first album, people now in their 30s and possibly even 40s. But it's an attractive piece of music, and in an age when... Um, the, uh, there is a new radio station entirely divided, devoted to the, uh, the world's most beautiful music. I think that Mike Oldfield's new record hits a similar chord. People want attractive tunes. This new album, uh, Tubular Bells 2, provides those attractive tunes. Attractive tunes which sound not unlike the attractive tunes of uh, Tubular Bells 1 20 years ago, but attractive nonetheless. He and his record company, Virgin EMI now, have never been very happy bedfellows, have they? Tell us a story about that. Well, the first album, Tubular Bells 1, um, sold 16 million copies, and it took Virgin Records from being a pretty small avant-garde student rock type label to being a genuine contender. Um, and 
which now has gone on to form an airline and to extrapolate into all sorts of other business ventures. Richard Branson has sold it to EMI to concentrate on flying and, uh, and those other ventures. Um, but Mike Oldfield's career did not prosper in the same way as the label which he, whose success he had a lot to do with. Um, he made two more records straight after Tubular Bells called Armadorn and Hergest Ridge. They were successful, but less so. And thereafter, his records um, sold fewer and fewer, though they were attractive, but they couldn't get radio play because uh, the national pop radio station, Radio One, um, remains... A, a station devoted to playing music in three-minute chunks, which you can dance to. Um, and so there was no place where the kind of music that Mike Oldfield was playing could get access, could actually seize the public ear. Um, at the same time of which is a Virgin Records, I think, probably lost interest in trying to promote it in other ways. Uh, to the point when he came to make his 13th album for Virgin Records, uh, Mike Oldfield promoted it himself with his own money um, because he felt his record company were taking no interest. And though he has actually nurtured the idea of making a successor to Tubular Bells for some time, he held off until he could get out of his Virgin contract and go to another record company, which is Virgin EMI's rival Warner Brothers. So has he learned his lesson? Is he um, going to make an awful lot of money out of this one? Um, I've no doubt he's going to make a great deal more money out of this one than he made out of the first one. Um, I have not read the large print, never mind the small print of his contract. But these days, artists are in a much better position in terms of their financial relationship with their record company. Finally, perish the thought, a Tubular Bells 3. How likely do you think that is? Um, well, it's the same argument that applies, I think, to Hollywood films, is that people talk about Tubular Bells 2 as a sequel to Tubular Bells 1, but I think it's no more a sequel than a sort of copy, in the same way as, I say, Beverly Hills Cop 2 is pretty much a copy of Beverly Hills Cop 1. Um, I don't think Mike Oldfield is actually particularly mercenary. I don't think he is, his motivation is fundamentally financial. I think that he will be happy to have proved himself again by getting back to the top of the charts with a piece of music that is, is again, widely appreciated. I doubt there will be a Tubular Bells 3, or at least perhaps not for another 20 years. But Tubular Bells 2 will be in your record collection. It's a fun piece of music. Matt Snow, thanks for joining us. Thank you.